Welcome to session number 20 of our study, which is uh, Revelation chapter 15. And I've given you pages 177 through 184. Uh, let's look at the verse 1 on, on chapter 15 on page 177. And it says, And I saw another sign. We're going to come back to that, but I saw a sign in heaven. Uh, that's the same Greek word that, that John used in Revelation chapter 12 where he says a great wonder. Same identical Greek word. He says, I saw a sign in heaven. And of course, now where's heaven? Heaven is my throne, right? And so I, this is where I'm seeing this stuff happen at in the, in the spiritual dimension, and the throne room kingdom of God. Great and marvelous seven angels. How many? This is very important because where have we seen seven angels before? Churches. All right, good, good, good. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. Now you need to realize last plagues. Won't be any more plagues after the last one, right? How many days are after the last day? <laughs> no more days, right? So this is going to wind something up. Last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Filled up the wrath of God. Now we'll look at that word sign just a minute. Okay, let me... Get my sign. There's the same word that we looked at earlier. And it's, uh, it means an indication. Uh, so if it's not a real event, it's an indication. It's an indication of something. And this is the same word that he's used as, uh, as wonders. It's the same word that he's used uh, throughout this, this whole time. It was the, the term he used with, a, with the mark of the beast. There's an indication of, of these things. Um, so that's an indication. So what was John seeing here a sign or an indication about? Revelation 15.1. What is the sign of, that he's seeing? What is, what is it about? Pardon? Sign in heaven, great, marvelous, seven angels. Okay. That's what he's seeing. This, so is he really seeing seven angelic creatures? Invisible creatures with wings and the way we perceive or have been taught of angels. No, it's an indication of, of seven angels having the seven last plagues. It's, he's really not looking here at, at seven angels. So this is what he's really seeing here. Let's make sure we get this. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. That's what the indication is about. So he's not actually seeing these angels. He's really seeing an indication of these angels. Now back in, the, in our notes on 177, uh, it's interesting that the word angels or angel is found in 70 passages in the Revelation. They do all of these wonderful things. If you look on 177 on the left column, come down to the very last paragraph there, which is about two-thirds down, where it starts with, interestingly, uh, in that paragraph that goes on to the next page, what I've done there for you is I've listed all the things that these angels do throughout the book of Revelation. In these 70-some-odd passages, the things that I went through them and I, I looked and, and saw what these angels do. Let me, let me just read a couple of them. You can read them whenever you want to. But just, just to show you what's in here, one thing is they cast the prayers upon the earth and invoke voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. This is, that's one thing they do. Uh, they bound and loosed demonic activity and demonic angels. Uh, another thing they did is they guarded the gates of the Lamb's wife. Remember that the angels are stationed at the pearly gates. Okay, this is, this is another thing that they do in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, they revealed what God was about to do. He, they, they, they are always as messengers and they're coming and they're revealing what God is about to do. You can read all those things for yourself, but, but, but there's one thing that I really want us to, to see and I think that you need to see. So in Revelation 22 and 8, let me read this to you. He says, and I, John, saw 
these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. The feet of what? Feet of the angel, right? Which showed me these things. And 22, 9, it says, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. Don't worship me. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Now, what I'm wanting us to see here is, was this angel that we're talking about here, a creature in heaven, or a fellow servant and a brother and the Lord, who was expected to keep the sayings of this book? Was it necessary for an angel to keep the sayings of the book? Who was supposed to keep the sayings of the book? And if he's an angelic creature, how can he be a brother and a fellow servant to John? Are you, are you following my, my thought here? How can this be what we think of as an angelic creature, but yet, yet, yet still be a person or, a, or a, someone or whatever who is supposed to keep the sayings of that book? Who was supposed to keep the words of the prophecy? Were angelic creatures supposed to keep the words of that prophecy? Remember in, in Revelation 1-3 it says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. So are angels supposed to keep the words of the prophecy or are or, or people? Okay, all right, all right. You're, you're, all, you're, you're, you're ahead of me. Okay, <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it, though. But that's, that's what I want you to see, is that this, this, the angels in the book of Revelation and, and all of those things that, that are doing here, that, are, that I've listed for you, that they do, aren't what flying creatures, invisible creatures are supposed to be doing. It's what you and I are supposed to be doing. How many believe that we should be guarding the gates of the Lamb's wife, of the Lamb's wife, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. I just wish we could wear white. <laughs> well, you do, you do, you do. <laughs> and of course, we've seen that the throwing of the, of the incense and the fire upon the earth was prayer. You know, it was the incense. It was imprecatory type prayers. It was praying, thy kingdom come. When we pray, thy kingdom come, whether it's in our life or whether it's for a region or for in the life of someone else, and it's an imprecatory prayer. And when the kingdom comes, it comes with violence. Jesus said... It comes with violence, and the violent take it by force. So, so this is what I'm wanting us to see. I want to look at one more verse here. and uh, That's not right. Okay. Revelation 19.10 says, Then I fell down at his feet. This is another verse that I want to, want to make sure that we see. That. Fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said, No, don't worship me, for I am a servant of God just like you and other brothers and sisters who testify of their faith in Jesus. So is this a creature? Is this a, or is this a person? What would, you, what would you think? Sure. Worship God, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness of Jesus. Now, what, what I liked about, about this verse is, again, John is trying to worship this angel, and he won't let him worship him. Um, does a... Angel, as we think, angel, uh, um, an angelic creature, does, do they need the testimony of Jesus? Do we need? Do we? Need? <laughs> Let's look at the New Living Translation. Well, I thought that was. I think that was a New Living Translation. I think somewhere I've messed up my little thing. But I think that's, that's the New Living Translation, I think, of, of what I wanted us to see. For I am a servant of God just like you. That's what, that's what I really like. So what do you think? Are, are, are these angels creatures or are they really people like you and me who should be doing all of these things like binding demons, like guarding the gates of the Lamb's wife that are casting fire or prayers upon the earth? What do you think? So I want, what, I want, what I want us to see is that all the way through the book of Revelation as these angels are ministering, it's really talking about us. It's really talking about the saints of God uh, going through the earth as the, as the army of God. 
So that's what I wanted us to really see here is these angels here. So what we've got here is our people. Uh, he saw a, a sign, and we, we talked about the sign as an indication. So, so we have an indication of angels. These are what angels are supposed to do. Okay, let's go back to our notes. Page 177, right column, about two-thirds of the way down. Paragraph that begins with to protect these seven angels, to project, to project these seven angels. As invisible winged creatures would be a totally miss, it would be to totally miss what John was revealing to us. The seven, the number of spiritual perfection, the number of the spirit, represented the spiritual fulfillment of heavenly ministry. These were ministries that understood God's will. Here they poured out his wrath. These seven angels were a part of this great and marvelous sign. They brought the seven last plagues. Now, you got to notice again that they brought the seven last plagues. Last plagues. Page 178. Now, we're about to read from um, the book of Deuteronomy. And I need to ask you first, to whom was the book of Deuteronomy written? The Israelites. What, 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 what does Deuteronomy mean? Do you know? Deuter. Duplication. It's a duplication of the law. He's saying it again. He's already written it in Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus. And now he's doing it again. He's Duda in it again. <laughs> it, means, it means to do it a second time is, is really what, what the word means. So what he's doing is he's repeating the book of Deuteronomy to them. And it's, it's, it, this is so important. So he's writing it to the children of, of, of Israel. He's not writing it to heathens. He's not writing it to you or me. He's writing it to them. This is who the law was given unto. Now let's come down there, if you will, with me to... Uh, to Deuteronomy 28, 59, because we're here talking about the, the plagues uh, that would, would come, that the seven angels would come. And what we're going to see is, is that it's, a, it's talking about a time when Moses would be terminated, the law of Moses, the age of Moses would give over to the age of Jesus Christ. Here we go. Deuteronomy 28, 59. Then the Lord will, will make thy plagues wonderful. And the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and, a long, and of long continuance. Wow. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of the law, them will the Lord bring upon thee, until thou be destroyed." In other words, things you haven't even thought of are going to happen to you. Verse 62, And ye shall be left few in numbers, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you. To do what? to destroy you and to bring you to nothing, to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whether thou goest to possess it. Wow. I know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what I wrote with this with. That's what I used when I was writing this. You know, back in the 90s, you couldn't use anything else if you did, especially in the Bible Belt. You were something wrong with you. So... <laughs> But we got through it. We got through it. But it's just here. Now we need to, uh, I need to read a lot now the next, for the next couple of paragraphs. So let's keep reading here. These plagues and horrors depicted exactly what happened in the land of Israel in the years of 66 through 70 A.D. Our God is as good as His Word. He exalts His Word by performing it. That terrible desolation was necessary it was necessary to prove the age of Moses ended and the age of Jesus Christ had begun. The number seven was used to describe the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. We are shown how God terminated the covenant. 
It happened exactly as he said it would in Deuteronomy 28. Had he not done this, people would continue to say the old covenant law continues. Well, they say it anyway, don't they? But when you understand it, when you understand what Moses is really doing here and what he's really saying and what this chapter in the book of Revelation is really about, all of a sudden, that old covenant law just, it just doesn't have the, the grip on us that it once did. It does not, it does not continue. These seven angels' fullness will fill up, fulfill the wrath of God. This termination and, and means of termination of the age of Moses must be settled. Until it is settled, we will concern ourselves with a great tribulation to come, Matthew 24, 21. We will be deceived seeing the church as second class and an, interpret, an, an interruption in God's plan. Now that's the dispensational doctrine. They say that they say that a great tribulation is coming, and they say that the church was a parenthetical addition that God had to come up with at the last minute because the Jews rejected Jesus. That's not at all correct. God had it planned from the beginning of time that this is what was going to happen, and that's exactly what did happen. The truth is the great tribulation terminated the covenant made by God and the people in the wilderness. Come down to uh, Revelation 15:2. Now, I'm going to get into some more of Deuteronomy in just a little while. So we're not going to talk a whole lot there. It, it'll become crystal clear to us in just a little while. Revelation 15, 2 says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass. Now, have we seen this before? Have we, has he talked about this sea of glass before? Remember it? Just, you, remember, you might not remember where, but you remember that we have talked about it, right? Sea of glass, and this time it's mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over the image and over his mark and over the number of the names stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Now, these, these that have gotten the victory are standing on top of this sea of glass that is mingled with fire. Now, what is this sea of glass? Let's take a second and find out. We've seen it before. It was in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. And there it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass. Sea of glass. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were the four beasts full of eyes before and behind. We've seen it before. But what's different about it this time? It was in, in Revelation 4, 6, it's what? It's crystal clear. Right? But now in Revelation 15, 2, how does it look? It's got fire in it. In other words, God's hot. God's mad. The wrath of God is about to come out. And these are standing on it. His wrath is about to be poured out. Um, talking about the overcomers, those that had gotten the victory over the mark and, and over the beast. They had gotten overcomers. Now, another interesting thing here is they had harps of God. Is that what it says? Having the harps of God. That's an interesting thought. They had the harps of God. Um, harps in the Bible, now we, won't, we don't think of it this way, but as you run references and you study it, and I've got you all kinds of references here. Where are they? They're on page 179. Uh, 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 one come down to where the paragraph begins with, we probably do not think of harps as being used for rejoicing. <laughs> there are several references there for you that, that tell you that as you run those references, you'll find, and I'm going to show you just one of them, you'll find that, that harps are instruments of, of rejoicing and joy. Uh, it would be very similar to the using, use of harps in their um, orchestras as our keyboard. That's kind of, I mean, they would, they would make it happy, you know. We think of harps as a real slow thing, but, but they, would, they, would, they would use them for that kind of feel like, like a keyboard does. So harps of God, and, and uh, let me show you that, that uh, in First Chronicles 13, 8, this is just one of those scriptures there. It says, David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their, with, with all their might before God with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, cymbals, and trumpets. So what were these guys doing standing on this sea of glass mingled with fire playing harps? What were they doing? 
celebrating. They're rejoicing. Now, you know, get, I mean, it's, it's difficult because of our manby pamby, you know, Christian attitude. Um, somebody's about to get the wrath of God, and these guys are rejoicing. In other words, something good's about to happen, and though it's bad, it's, it's going to be good. It's sweet to his mouth like honey, but bitter to the stomach. And this is, this is the thought here. But they're actually, you know, rejoicing. Page 179. I want to read uh, to you a quote from Delbert Young on a book he wrote <laughs> of God's salvation, what is it? Actually, I'm going to read you two quotes because we don't, we don't see our salvation this way. But as, I, as I'm teaching about, and this may be something we do on Wednesdays here, is go through some fundamental foundational things on Wednesday nights. But one of the things that are, that are fun, fundamental is just understanding what salvation really is. It's really not going to heaven when you die. It's really enjoying a victorious life right now. Now, it is going to heaven. You un, are you understanding that? I, I know I didn't say it that way, but yes, it is. There's an eternal reward. There's an eternal life, but it doesn't have to be just that. It's, it's for right now as well. And so what, what, what I want to quote to you here from the, from the book I wrote uh, on, on the uh, left column at the very top, biblical salvation, the salvation won for us by Jesus Christ includes deliverance from the enemy, vengeance and destruction executed upon the enemy, plundering the devil's kingdom, and rejoicing in the victory. Salvation is abundant life now. Now, think about that just a second, and I'm going to quote you for here in just a second. But every time that you find where, where salvation was given in God, for example, the very first time was when Moses stretched forth his rod and over the Red Sea, and he said, stand still and see the salvation of God. All right, what happened then? The Red Sea, of course, opened. They had plundered Egypt. We talked about that a little bit this morning, right? They plundered Egypt. They went through the Red Sea. Then what happened? They closed in on the enemies, destroyed them. Vengeance was executed. And then what did they do? What did Miriam and Moses and... Didn't they? And see, that's, that's biblical salvation, all right? Another one is in Second Chronicles. You know, there you got there you got this army that's that's around. Uh, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, oh man, Jeho Jehoshaphat. Yeah, King Jehoshaphat. And so he he tells him that we're going to go out. The word of the Lord comes to a prophet, and he, he relays it to Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat says, "Okay, uh, the word of the Lord is the battle's not yours; it's mine." So he sends him out with the praisers first. And they go forth, cause all kind of confusion. Then they go and the enemies are kill themselves. <laughs> they, they get confused and they start fighting amongst themselves. They kill themselves. They go plunder and then they start rejoicing. And, and every time you find biblical salvation, you find these four principles. You find these things happening. And this is what's happening here in the book of Revelation. These harps, these people are on top of this sea of glass with this fire in it. And it's, it's, it's something bad's about to come come on somebody, and they're, and they're having a party. Now, let me read the second quote to you. The first detail of business God's people did after deliverance, plunder, and destruction of the Egyptians was to rejoice. Moses began to sing, and Miriam began, to da began dancing. Have you ever, have you ever <clears throat> ingested what Moses sang? He vividly described the Lord gave his people salvation by drowning the enemy. I will sing unto the Lord, for he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and the riders fall into the sea. Perhaps a little morbid to our Western mentality, but extremely biblical. The Lord de delivers his people, plunders the enemy, executes vengeance upon the enemy, and, and at that his people rejoice. We dance, we sing, we carry banners. Salvation is to rejoice in. God's people are not completely expressed. Let me start over. God's people have not completely expressed nor experienced salvation until rejoicing happened. Wow. So the harp was intended for gladness, and these overcomers had their harps. They were, they were happy. 
Now look, look at Revelation 15, 3, down about the bottom of that left column. And they sang the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of, La of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And you get the picture? What John is saying, he says, I saw a sign. It's, it's, it's not a real thing. It's, you know, this is kind of like it was happening. It was, it's a, what was the word that I used? What was the word that the word meant? Uh, it was an indication. He says, and this, it, this, is, this, is how it was, this is how it was happening on this sea of glass. And, and so he's explaining this. And what these people are doing is they're having a party and they're singing this song. They're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now, to properly help us and make sure that we get our understanding on this, I've got to use a lot of scripture. But what you will see is what the song of Moses really is. And what the song of Moses was about is a witness against Israel. It declared the day of the Lord or the day that the law of Moses or the age of Moses would be terminated. Now, the, the book of Deuteronomy is about the second reading of the law. The book of Deuteronomy ended with Moses doing what? Anybody remember? Dying. Now, who did Moses, who did God, hand the leader, leadership of, of, the, of the people over to Joshua? What does Joshua mean in Hebrew? Jesus. The, the, he, the Hebrew and Greek equalization of that term, Yeshua, means Jesus. Now, God in his foreknowledge, when Moses died, gave it to Joshua or to Jesus. And this is, this is, I mean, this is amazing when you really start learning what the Bible really talks about and what it's really saying. So, sure enough, this is exactly what, what's happened, and that's what, that's what we're reading about. The Lord spoke to Moses in, 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 the, in the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to read it in here in just a second, just going to kind of get you caught up with us. But the Lord spoke to Moses and instructed him to present him and Joshua at the tabernacle. And what was going to take place here is he was going to tell Moses to write a song. And he was going to tell Moses that Joshua would take the leadership after him. And he says, I want you to write a song that's a witness against, we're going to read all this in just a second, just kind of making sure we get it. I'm going to write a song that's a witness against these people. He says, they will go a whoring after the gods of the strangers. Now, I know you're not as familiar with the book of Revelation as I am, but the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation talks about the great whore. Now what he's saying here is they're going to go a-whoring. They're going to commit adultery against me. I am going to divorce them. She's going to die. I'm going to be a free God and I'm going to get me another wife. This is, I, I know we don't think like this, but this is, I want to show you, this is in today's lesson, Okay. <laughs> Well, all right, then. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, in Deuteronomy 31, 17, the Lord told Moses and Joshua what's going to happen. That they, the, the nation's going to go off, and he's going to forsake them. I'm on page 180. And that meant that he was going to divorce her. Now, I know in our theology and how we think about things, that shouldn't be, but... I can prove it to you, and I'm going to prove it to you right now. God got a divorce. In Isaiah 50 and 1, you see it? Let's read this. Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? Whom have I put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. And I saw, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, 
but went and played the harlot also. Now, now you've, you've, uh, you, uh, you've heard me talk about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel, the southern kingdom was Judah. What had happened when Solomon had died, his son Rehoboam took charge and he increased taxes and there was a rebellion. He wouldn't work with the people. So a guy named Jeroboam got 10 of the tribes to rebel against Rehoboam and create the northern kingdom. And they went up there and they created all of this idolatry. And they did all of this crazy worship. And that's what, what, um, what is now known as Syria, I think, is, am I right on that? Jesus. The, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But anyway, that's, 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 what, that's what happened here, and that's, this, is what we're, this is what we're talking about. You know what I want to do? Now, this is not in my notes, and I didn't even think about it, but I would like to look at Jeremiah 3.8 in, uh, in some of the other translations. Let me, uh, let me pull up my Bible program. Uh, that's the wrong thing. I want to go to the Bible right here. Let's look at it in the NIV. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. Because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and wood. Let's see what the New Living Translation says. She paid no attention. She saw that I had divorced faithless Israel and sent her away. But now Judah too has left me and given herself to prostitution. Well, well. What do you think about that? And that's what happened in here. And this is what, this is what Revelation 17 is going to be kind of about, is, is she's going to die. This is what happens. Babylon is going to fall, and her, the ones that she committed adulteries and harlotries with, the nations, is going to kill her. And this is, this is what, this chapter 17. All right. Okay, uh, so... Bible says to cast out the bondwoman and her son. So the whore was put away and uh, she'll die in chapter 18. Now I know that's heavy theology. I know that's probably just did this to us, right? Just went right over our heads. But, but at least you got something here to, to chew on and you can see if it's, if it's accurate, right? So uh, let me look at my notes here. I want to read to you now in uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, I mean chapter uh, 31, where Moses has now gone and, 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 and show you what's happening here in the song of Moses. Let's see. So Deuteronomy 31, and let me, let me just, we'll just read it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. Tabernacle is important. You need to remember that, that word. It's going to come up again in just a little while in the, in the Revelation. Tabernacle. Next verse. And the Lord God appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. Are you, are you getting the picture? There's this, you know, I've showed you the tabernacle before. God says, Moses, you and Joshua, show yourselves up here. I gotta, I gotta put a charge on Joshua so he'll take over when, when, uh, when, when you die. And I want you to come because your days are, are uh, about to run out. Next verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Let me make sure we get it. Read that one one more time. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep. You're going to die, and you're going to go with your fathers, 
And this people will rise up after you and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land. Next verse, 17. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them. And they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? 17, going through 19. Verse 18, And I will surely hide my face in that day of all the evils which they shall have wrought, and in that they are turned unto other gods. Now, therefore, write you this song for you. What are they singing now? These, these, these guys on the sea of glass with the, mingled with fire. What are they singing? Remember? Song of Moses. The song of the Lord. Write you this song. Now, uh, a lot of, uh, of commentators and books, and I'm going to give you a list at the end of all of them, how they, how they teach this. They think that uh, what the song of Moses is, is what I just referred to earlier, when they had gone through the Red Sea and the Red Sea had closed upon the enemy and that they were rejoicing, they think that's the song. No, Moses didn't write that song. Moses sang that song. But here is the song of the Lord, uh, the song of Moses. God says, now therefore write you this song for you. And look at this, teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths. Make them memorize it. Put it in their mouths. That this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Now, what was the song of Moses to be? A witness against the children of Israel. One more verse. Now, write down for yourselves this song. Do what? It just sounds like negative. It's a negative start to God's relationship with God's people. Well, it's not the start. It's, it's, he's telling them. Yeah, he really. You're, well, you're right. You're kind of right there. But he knew. He just knew. He knew that they were going to, they were going to forsake him. They were going to kill his son. They were going to, you know, they, he was, that they were going to do this. And he's telling them what they're going to do. And when you do it, and that's what he, the blessings and the cursings that are in Deuteronomy, if you'll do well, you'll be blessed. But if not, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> now write down, now write down for yourselves this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it. Sing your doctrine. You sing what you believe so that it may be a witness for me against them. He says that two times. So that's what this song is about. The song of Moses. This is it. Uh, this was the witness against them. Uh, it was a song about the day that God would forsake forever Israel. Judaism, the law of Moses. And that day came in AD 70. And that's what the book of Revelation is mostly about. Okay. So Moses was to teach it to them. Moses was to write it down. Look at, look at 19, there we go. Write it down. This is the NIV version of uh, verse 19. So this is the song. Okay. Back to page 180. Right column, uh, second paragraph down where it starts, John did not go. John did not go into detail about the song. There was no need. His, his readers, those fleeing from Jerusalem and coming out of Babylon, Revelation 18.4, had memorized the song of Moses. It was a requirement for every Jewish male. It was saying at every feast as men, women, and children came together. Not a single Jewish person would not know what was stated in the song of Moses. Now we are the ones who do not understand it. How many, how many people have you ever heard talk about this? I mean, we don't know Squat, <laughs> you know? And it's not because we don't want to know, it's because we're not taught well. We're just not taught well. 
So this is, this is what the song of Moses, and this is what they were singing. Moses wrote the song. He called the elders, and he taught them to sing it, and the elders went and taught the people to sing it. And we're going to look at a lot more scriptures with this, but if you'll come down to, uh, that goes through this song that he's, that he's writing now. Now we're going to go through the song. Uh, and you can, you can read it for yourself. It begins there on, in chapter uh, 32. And it goes right on, right on through it. But come down to the bottom of the page where Deuteronomy 32.5 is. I'm just going to pick out a, a selection, a few selections that really ampl- amplify what I'm trying to, trying to relate to you. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.5 says, They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. In other words, he's saying, these are not my children. Who did Jesus say was their daddy? The devil, right? Your father is the devil. And you do the works of your father. Right? Would you? <laughs> Jesus said their father was the devil. So he, he says they're not much. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's that thought again. Now this is in Deuteronomy. And it's talking about the same people. Now, the word spot there means blemish or birthmark. So what the Lord is saying here is they're not mine. They had a mark, but it was a different mark. They had a spot. They had a mark. So how many marks do we have? Two marks. Mark of the Lord and the mark of the beast. Wow. Wow. They're a perverse and crooked generation. Jesus always talked about that generation. He rebuked that generation over and over and over. We've looked at that how many times? Jesus said that all these things that he talked about for great tribulation was going to come upon that generation. Paul talked about that generation. And uh, in uh, Philippians 2.15, Paul says it's a crooked and a perverse nation. Let me, let me read that. Do you see where I am on 181? The left column about, uh, well, just about halfway down. Anyway, it's in italics, so you can see it. It says, Paul wrote that we may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Peter talked about it too. He says, save yourselves. This was on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, you remember what happened... Uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit came. Peter's out there talking to the Jews. He says, you men of Jerusalem and Judea, listen, hearken to me. You better listen to me. And this is what he tells them. Save yourselves, you men of Jer- Jerusalem and Judea. Save yourselves from this untoward or this warped is what that word means. This warped generation. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? So the song went on. And, and anyway, look over on the right column. Um, Deuteronomy 32, 23. Let's, let's read these verses. God says, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them and the poison of serpents of the dust. So who upon whom would the beast come? The beast isn't going to come on the Gentiles. The beast isn't going to come on us. The beast is coming on them. Came on them is a better way of putting it. Deuteronomy 32, 25 says, The sword without, the terror within, shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Going down to 32, 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot, sh- and vengeance is important. You might want to circle it because I'm going to talk about that in just a second. To me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. 41. If, if I wet my glittering sword, if he sharpens it, and mine hand taketh hold on judgment, I will render vengeance, there it is again, to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. Wow. Rejoice, O ye nations, with the people 
for he will avenge the blood of his servants. What did Jesus talk about in Matthew 23? Yep. You're going to, you're going to kill all my apostles and you're going to scourge them and you're going to crucify them. And he says, so that the blood of righteous, from righteous Abel all the way to Zechariah can come upon you. Mm. Blood of, of his servants and will render vengeance, there it is again, to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Uh, let me show you this now. I've, we've, I've shown it to you before. But this is exactly what Jesus said in Luke 21, talking about vengeance. Now, what he's talking about here is, 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 is Luke talking about the great tribulation thing that's come upon him. You know, I've read it to you before. And he talks about how, uh, how, you know, when you see Jerusalem compassed about, get out of here. You know, flee, get into the mountains. You know, and we, we've talked about the, the meanings of mountains and those kinds of things. But anyway, Luke 21, 21, Jesus says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance. That how many things? How many how many of these plagues? Fullness of plagues, the last plague, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Yeah. Right. And we're going to read that in just a second. That's a good point, surely. Whoa. Whoa. It was written on the tables of stone in the tabernacle. This was the law of Moses. This is what was really put in there. This is what they sang. Whoa, Shirley, that was very good. Well, yeah, they knew. Yeah, they knew. They were, they, but they sang it. I mean, you know, yeah, they knew. That's what was. That's what's. That's what. That's what's kind of amazing, isn't it? But anyway, this is. These are the days of AD seventy. Uh, remember, the, you know that the seven angels had the seven last plagues. Jesus says, "All things which are written may be fulfilled." Remember that the last thing that Moses did was write this song. And then he went into the mountain and he died. And he gave control of the nation and the people of God to Joshua who took, went and possessed the land. And that's what's happened in the spiritual dimension. The, the law of Moses, Judaism, all that's done. And they, you know the, 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 the doctrine, they're going to rebuild it, they're going to restore it, they're going to do all this stuff. You know, it's just not in here. And I don't, you know, I mean, if you, if you just study the Bible, you'll find that it's just not in here. And, and what, what Moses did was go in the mountain and he died and gave the leadership to Joshua or Jesus. And that's exactly what happened. The age of Moses ended, the age of Jesus began. Back to, back to our notes. On uh, 181, um, very bottom, Revelation 15, 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Now, let's stop here just a second. Where was the Ark of the Covenant? Was it in the tabernacle? Sure. And it was, so is this what we're talking about? It was, this was the temple, actually, but it was the tabernacle of the testimony. So in the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, and what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law, the law of Moses. Verse 6 says, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. Now, where did they get them? <laughs> what, he, what he's trying to show us is that they're bringing out of, the, out of the tabernacle, they're bringing out of the Ark, they're bringing out of the temple, the things that were written on the law of Moses clothed in pure white linen, which is purity. And I've, I've, I'll give you all this stuff. I'll give you a lot more stuff that I'm able to talk about and make sense to you uh, during our times together and having their breast girded with golden girdles. Let's, let's read that, uh, that next paragraph. Moses had the book of the law placed in the ark. It contained all the curses and the song. These curses were not to come upon another nation. They were to come upon the nation of Israel. Not to come upon America, they're not to come upon any other. They're to come, they were, this was to come upon them. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is, is a proclamation of the changing of guard, the changing of the kingdom, the ending of one and the beginning of another. 
the ending of Moses, the beginning of Jesus. So the Ark of the Testimony was open. The angels came flying out. They had the last plagues. So proper biblical uh, interpretation uh, can allow this to be nothing else but the end of Moses. End of the law, end of Judaism. And it is. It was. It's never been rebuilt. It will never be rebuilt. Uh, God's not going to let it be rebuilt. And we're not going to go back to animal sacrifices. We're not going to build another temple. That's it. Okay, flip over with me to page 183. And for about the first time, I think, in all of our times, I'm going to spend a little time here on contemporary theological views next few minutes. Um, here's the verse about the, the song of Moses, uh, Revelation 15, 3. They sang the song of Moses and the, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Um, nearly all dispensationalists say this song was the song of Exodus 14, which I've talked to you, to you earlier about where the Red Sea was open. Uh, this, uh, who am I quoting here? Ray Stedman. He says this, The host of martyrs sings two songs. The song of Moses, recorded in Exodus 15, it's actually 14 and 15, and the Israelites came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. So this is, this is their basic stand about how to interpret that. But that's not at all, that was not the song of Moses. They hardly ever relate well, only, I don't think I only found one that even mentioned that Deuteronomy uh, 32. Uh, on page 184, Leon Morris here has a, a really unique look at this. <laughs> he says this is Moses singing and Jesus singing as they meet. I guess they meet in heaven and they're singing. So they're singing, Moses and Jesus are singing says here, but it is much more likely that there is but one song with a double title. Now, down, if you will, middle of that column, I start a paragraph where it says we have a stack of reference books. I want to read this to you. I, as I was doing this, and I did this from 90, around 96 or something like that until 99, we had just ended the book of Revelation study when the Y2K thing was getting hot and the changing of the century and, you know, in, in, in millennia even. And so it was a very hot topic at that time. And I had studied this thing and over, over all these years and I had a stack of books. I mean, I mean uh, you see the, the big green containers that, that we put stuff in. I guess we all put stuff in with the covers on them and stuff. Anyway, I had that thing completely full of reference books. And I, so I list some here of... of, of of the books that I used and how they did not reference Deuteronomy 32. Let me read this to you. We have a stack of reference books used to this study and reference. Listed here are some who do not mention references to the Song of Moses from Deuteronomy 31 and 32. The books are Revelation Revealed by Jack Van Empey, Revelation Illustrated and Made Plain by Jim LaHaye, Revelation Visualized by Gary Cohen and uh, Salem. Herban, I think that he is actually a Jewish person. Tyndall's New Testament Commentaries, Revelation by Leon Morris, The Prophecies and Symbols of Revelation by Jimmy Swaggart, The Revelation uh, of John, Volume 2 by William Barclay, Behold, He Cometh by John R. Rice, Exploring Revelation by John Phillips, a Revelation Expounded by Phineas Jennings Dake, Breaking the Code by Bruce Metzger, Wycliffe Commentary places Deuteronomy 32 in parenthesis with no explanation. Then Wycliffe quotes Lee saying, he's quoting somebody else saying, the song in which Moses celebrated the deliverance from Egypt is now renewed. So he again goes back to the thought of, of uh, the Red Sea opening, renewed and receives his perfect close when God's people are finally delivered by the Lamb. Uh, Come over to the right column, please, uh, the very last paragraph, and let me read this to you. Why do so many not mention the Deuteronomy reference? There should only be two reasons. Reason number one is innocence. They were simply not aware of the song in Deuteronomy 31 and 32. Reason number two causes us to wonder. If they knew it were there, then why not reference it? It is, in, it is in direct contrast with the dispensational doctrine. That's why it doesn't fit their doctrine. 
They, they, yep, they do. They do. And there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female or, or bond nor free. You know, and that's, and that's, this is the, this is what, what pop, prop, proper New Testament theology must encompass. It's a direct contrast with the dispensational doctrine. It spoke of a day when Moses would end with tribulation and destruction. Plagues would come and God would end the covenant. The day the Lord Jesus walked the earth was the beginning of that day. And it came in finality, 70 AD. Now let's make this somewhat applicable. So if this is true, and if this has really happened, and the song of Moses has taken place, where does that put us today? Where are we today? Plague free. Plague free? That's good. Beyond tribulation. I like that. That's a good way of play. That's a good one. I'm going to write that one down. Beyond tribulation. I ought to write a book. Beyond the tribulation. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That is good. Okay, and you know, and you know, I've shown you the thing where Jesus says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to another people. So the kingdom was passed. So what I'm wanting us to see, and I'm wanting everybody in the world to see, is that we are now living in the kingdom. There's not another one coming. How long will this one last? Forever. There is no end. And we have got to somehow not only realize ourselves, but somehow communicate this to people. Folks, you're missing the kingdom. You're putting your hopes and flying away when God wants you to have an abundant life now. So. I know they don't. I got both. <laughs> well, okay, they think they do. I got you. I understand. But isn't it sad, though? My, my point is, it's so sad to me that people are so frightened. They'll serve God because they're frightened, not because they want to have an abundant life and live by his precepts and concepts. You know, that's, that's so much of, of what I hear today. But anyway, what I want you to see is that where that puts us is it puts us right smack dab in the middle of his kingdom. And together we can change.